Schönen guten Morgen, herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums und herzlich willkommen auch im Namen des ähm, Filmkollektiv Frankfurt. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass Sie es heute bei diesem schönen Wetter und um die ähm, ja etwas äh, natürlich ungewohnte oder nicht ganz so übliche Uhrzeit um 12 Uhr quasi zur Matinee-Vorstellung gekommen sind. Und ja, ich möchte Sie beglückwünschen, dass Sie das gemacht haben, denn der Film, den wir jetzt sehen, Il était une fois Beirut, Histoire d'une Star, es war einmal Beirut, Geschichte eines Stars, ist ähm, aus meiner Sicht ein sehr perfekter und ein sehr wunderbarer Matinee-Film. Und ich, ähm, also seit Feststand, dass wir das Programm machen würden, ähm, war ich auch die ganze Zeit sehr, sehr vorfreudig, gerade auf diesen Film und bin ja sehr aufgeregt und sehr berührt, dass dieser aus meiner Sicht eine der ja vielleicht äh, schönsten ähm, Oden an das Kino und an die lebenserhaltende Kraft des Kinos wir jetzt äh, hier auf 35 mm in der derzeit einzigen bekannten projizierbaren Filmkopie sehen können und ja, es ein sehr ähm, emotionaler Moment, weil ich auch, als ich den Film vorbereitet habe für die Untertitelung, ähm, ja, also sehr, sehr berührt war von dem Film und mich freue, dass wir ihn alle zusammen sehen können. Die Tatsache, dass wir sehen können, verdanken wir auch der Ko äh, Kooperation mit dem Deutschen Filminstitut, Deutsches Filmmuseum. Ich möchte nochmal ganz herzlich Andreas Beilhardt vom Deutschen Filminstitut, Filminstitut Filmmuseum danken, dass wir das so schön wieder machen können und dann auch im Juni wieder machen werden bei Marco Ferreri und äh, den ähm, Leuten danken, denen wir verdanken werden, dass wir das auch machen können, nämlich dem Vorführer Michael Besser, Christian Appelt bei den Untertiteln und Mathilde Ruxell, die die Untertitel überwachen wird. Also vielen Dank euch. Und bevor ich das Wort gleich an äh, Jocelyn Saab und äh, Mirna Macaron übergebe, ähm, hat der libanesische Honorarkonsul äh, Herr Kalab äh, ist hier. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass er uns ein kurzes Begrüßungswort sagen wird. Herzlich willkommen. So, schönen guten Tag. Äh, ich bedanke mich sehr für, für die Ihre Anwesenheit und die Interesse an die libanesischen Filme. Für uns als Libaneser ist es eine große Ehre, dass ein Film bei Ihnen vorgestellt wird. Auf jeden Fall, das ist nicht was Neues für uns als Libaneser. Wir sind sehr stolz. Wir haben vor 6000 Jahren die erste Alphabet nach Europa geschickt, von den libanesischen Häfen nach Griechenland. Und ich hoffe, dass wir irgendwie eine schöne Botschaft an die deutschen Leute, die interessiert haben an die libanesischen Filme, und wünsche ich Ihnen alles, alles Gute. Und ich bedanke die Frau Justine Saab und Frau Marc an die Interesse und so, solche Sachen zu produzieren. Ich wünsche Ihnen viel Spaß und Ahlan und Sahlan. Vielen Dank. Ja, und dann äh, möchte ich Sie bitten, mit mir zusammen herzlich zu begrüßen, äh, die, Hauptdarst die Hauptdarstellerin äh, des Films Il était en Mirna Macaron. Hallo. Und äh, die Filmemacherin Jocelyn Saab. Ich würde auf Deutsch und danach auf Englisch. Es ist für mich sehr, sehr berührend hier zu sein, weil ich kenne Jocelyn als, seit ich 18 bin. Ich bin 43 heute. Und dank an ihr, mein Leben hat sich geändert. Und, ähm, und die Liebe für Cinema auch ist ähm, größer geworden. Und ich habe Justine seit sehr lange nicht gesehen und jetzt sind wir zusammen wieder. Und meine Kinder sind auch hier, so ist es ein sehr wichtiger und äh, berührender Moment für mich. Und danke für die Filmkollektive Gari, Filmmuseum Frankfurt. Vielen, vielen Dank, weil das ist sehr, sehr wichtig. Justine ist eine besonders und ähm, ganz tolle Frau, super Regisseurin. Und mit ihr habe ich viel, viel gelernt, seit ich 18 Jahre Hast du verstanden? Tu as compris? Non, mais je te remercie. C'est pour moi un moment très important, très unique d'être là avec mes enfants, de leur faire découvrir ce film. Diesen Film habe ich mit 18 gemacht. Ich bin nicht mehr Schauspielerin, ich mache Filme im Moment, aber damals, ich bin mit Krieg aufgewachsen und dank an Jocelyn habe ich meine Stadt kennengelernt. Ich bin in einer, im Ostbeirut aufgewachsen, das ist genau wie Berlin und dank an ihr habe ich die andere Seite kennengelernt und mein Land und viel über Politik und Menschen. Und vielen Dank, Jocelyn. Merci. Uh, just uh, to tell you that this was shot after 15 years of civil war. And I came back to Beirut and I said, 
everybody's going to forget what happened, and this is terrible. I have to constitute a sort of patrimony, which is the most important thing. I have to constitute the memory of my country. Why this war happened? Who, were, who, who are we? But I didn't want to give lessons. So I just went to look in the cinematography of the others, Lebanese, Egyptian, Americans, how did they see the city? And so I let two girls between Amirna, who was 18 at the time, and Michelle, and the other actor, to jump like, like you are going to do tonight, until this noon, to jump into the films and suddenly to become characters. So if you follow them, you will become character in the film. It's true we didn't have means like a big American film. We had little money. But it took me maybe four or five years to find all this material. Uh, sometimes it's full of humor. Sometimes you go into a Western. Sometimes you go back into the 30s. Don't try to find um, a real historical of time. It's like memory. Memory is something that comes uh, what you did, the buffet, like uh, souvenirs like this comes, like images, a flashback like images. And there's something that imposes itself is the quality of the, the film. The 30s could not go with the 60s, the 60s could not go with the 70s. It's very strange. I couldn't mix them as uh, in the editing. So, and it gives this film, which is all of souvenirs that comes out and which will make you love very often. And uh, we'll tell you sometimes with humor, sometimes with irony, uh, sometimes with the tears, uh, what is a country and why it's so stupid to make it, to destroy it, because I'm against wars. Uh, have a nice screening and thanks for coming at this time of the day. That's very, very fantastic. <laughs> Vielen Dank und noch ein kurzer Hinweis. Also ich hoffe, dass Sie noch nach dem Film noch bleiben können. Es gibt dann ein ähm, Publikumsgespräch moderiert von Wafa Germani von der Cinematic Française mit Jocelyn und Mirna. Und jetzt gute Projektion. Das war short up. Ja, und herzlich willkommen nochmals an Jocelyn Zapp und Mirna Macaron. Und herzlich willkommen nochmal an Wafa Germani. Und ich übergebe dir das. Okay, so maybe I let some people go out and we start. Um, maybe first a question for for you, Jocelyn. Uh, you made that film ten years after a Vif Suspendu. So you after Vif Suspendu, you went back to documentary, and here it's as if you needed to go back to fiction again. Can you tell us a little more why you 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 had this urge to do another fiction? Oh, today I see it differently, but at that time, I remember I came back to Beirut and I felt that uh, like if everybody had forgotten the war and the horror we lived. And uh, I wanted to try to understand it, to understand why we had it. And uh, so... The idea was to go and see in the films, in the patrimony of the, that had the country, uh, how, what was the gaze of the uh, different filmmakers of the world on the city. I thought it could be a, a real richness. And that's how it, it's, uh, I decided to throw the two actresses in the film. And... Um, have a sociological look on the on the city. So that's how came first the idea. Then this, uh, it was the 100 years of cinema coming. And uh, I thought it would be a tribute to all my, to all these people that I time passed and I never had seen all, th all these films when I decided to make uh, once upon a time, Beirut. 
So it was a good um, honor to them, a good homage to them. And it would be an original idea. And uh, that's how it began. Because I suppose maybe you had seen some of the film of maybe the 70s, of the 80s, or absolutely any of them? Uh, we had, I had seen some of the American films that were in the cinemas in Beirut, but very strangely, not the Egyptian nor the Lebanese film. We consider them like uh, low-level films, and I didn't want, I, we weren't going to see them. And suddenly, everything I hadn't seen became a treasure because every, everything has been erased. And uh, so I went to find them. And the operation was also at the same time as a Cinematheque operation. I, take, I took some um, trainees, and we gathered through the city 400 VHS cassettes to watch everything possible and to gather the cinematography. And I remember I was calling all over the world the different Cinematheques to ask, um, do you have a film shot in Beirut? And uh, can you send it to me? Can I have the rights, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And uh, it's far in my mind, but I remember we were a huge crew of assistants working on trying to find the films. Then to write the story with the two girls, and we shoot extracts. We wrote the story. But uh, they, we shot, and then it, it was very difficult to edit. So we shot again some parts in Paris as if it was in Beirut, because we didn't have a penny in the pocket anymore. And that's how uh, it went. And for you, Mirna, had you seen any films when you, of those films, or any film on Beirut when you started doing the film? No, or? I didn't have seen anything, only the war and the school, what, nothing. And even when I shot with Justine, I didn't know what she was doing. I thought she was crazy and I didn't <laughs> understand. Yeah, because we had to shoot the scenes adapted to the stories she built after this huge archive. So I was like, um, for me, it was very confusing, but I enjoyed the experience very much. First, because I met a wonderful person who became a, a great friend. And also because I discovered my country that I didn't know. I, I lived in a very, um, like, um, in, in the eastern part of Beirut, which is the Christian part. And I only knew my street, my school, and our shelter that was like the Heizungskeller, which is um, not a shelter, but um, where the Heizung is, the, the radiator. And thanks to Justine, I discovered all this. And after I watched the movie, I was like, my God, this is, this is amazing. And now watching it 25 years later is a totally different experience. It's extremely touching. It's a film that, that I will keep with me for the rest of my life. And I'm extremely happy that my two children, who are German children, <laughs> are discovering it for the first time. It's, uh, it's extremely special. So how did you meet and did you train uh, Mirna and, and Michelle the same way you trained the other girl in La Vie Suspendue or how did you, did you work together? I can't remember really. I know I did casting. Yes, I did a casting. Really. Yeah, Mirna was dancing a lot. Uh, she was a dancer. Yeah, I was a dancer, but I did uh, start theater well, at the age of 15. I met Jocelyn, I was almost 18. So I did uh, yes, a bit of theater. and uh, uh, I like the idea of the blonde and the uh, brown, of uh, black. And uh, she, uh, I thought she could, she could play. Uh, it, w it was difficult to train them as much as I trained the girl of the first feature because uh, they were changing character, entering... Um, entering into uh, the different films. But um, in fact, I decided that I will keep their documentary character. There was just these girls coming from the war, knowing nothing, uh, just uh, superficial, uh, but very happy to, to, to go through this experience. So I used this. I, I think I had no time to work more. I left them as, as they were. They, are an, they were an image of the city, 
cutting too, and uh, but they were curious, and that's how I. But you used to talk to us a lot, so she used to explain a bit the the situation, the story behind, and um, yeah, and she asked us to be authentic, just to, and we became friends because we spent time together. Um, in different hotels, and 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 we 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 ha we, they put us all the time together in the same room and everywhere. So we became very close, and we we had nice time together. We are still friends with Michelle, yeah, since that time. So you see, she says I talk much to them. I can't remember, but for sure I I, yes. I had to, because these two girls were really a sort of. Um, uh, Two virgin of of the war uh, because they did never crossed from one part of the city to the other, so they didn't know this culture. They didn't know uh, this film. They didn't know the past. They didn't have time to know it. Actually, we didn't know the history because in our till today we don't have a history book in Lebanon. So I we studied the French history, which is crazy. I don't know the history of my country. I know it's since thanks to this movie or some documentaries we watch. So we grew up with the sounds of war, but not understanding what was going on. And if I, if somebody tells me civil war, I'm angry because we didn't only have civil war. We had Israel bombing us. We had Syria bombing us. We had us killing each other. We had the, the war of everyone against everyone in Lebanon. So it, there were so many wars that we just experience as bombed and plain. And, and thanks to Jocelyn, to this movie, you understand a bit more. Of course, it's a bit confusing for some of you because it is confusing even for me. But um, when you read, it's, it's scary. And it's, it's happening again. The history is happening again in another country today. So it's like repetitive and sad. And I think it's really interesting because for many years, in fact, Jocelyn, you created uh, an archive of the war, like by filming the people and you reusing some images of some dead people that were living at the time you showed them. You you, you create this, you created this uh, archive, and then for this uh, f fiction film, you you also changed somehow your mind and decided to ha have fiction that could also become uh, an archive and you mixed everything together and that's true it's very striking to see that yeah even spy films can make us understand the violence or sentimental film can make us understand the violence of this country as if it was already inherent and just uh, coming from fiction and just ready to explode into reality and um I think it was really strong. Was it, was it something you discovered while doing this uh, research on films? You selected some of the films that were really giving this impression of a latent violence, or it was a kind of surprise to realize that some film really already had this uh, violence in, in, to, in themselves? I don't know why. I thought that um, this material, I should watch it. There's something in it. And I asked, uh, between the assistant, there was a writer, Najwa Barakat, and uh, on, on, on 400 films, I think we kept uh, uh, six hours, six hours of extracts. And from the six hours, uh, there were themes we worked on and periods of time. And uh, that's at the uh, history time. And uh, for instance, you have the 30s, the colonization time which was exploiting, until, until now this exploited, the community once against the other. There is the, I go to the most caricatural one, the 70s, with all the American spies, because it's very caricatural. All film had spies coming to Beirut to make a complot, or some, some killing someone or, or spying on someone or, and uh, then there's the sheikh who's going to blow up the city with the mercure, the product. Like if the, in each uh, period of film, I found part of our history. And that was very strange to, to find in the American film the configuration of the war was shocking. And uh, the other was depainting the time. It's time. The, the Egyptian and Lebanese film were debating the um, la naivete, you the, 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 the naivety, yeah, of this modernism that was coming too quickly 
uh, that was covering the city too quickly and the people in their mentality and their way of thinking and their machism for the man uh, were not ready to to take this modernity. It was coming too quick. So it created this funny images of uh, when you have this guy dancing in the cabaret and uh, imaging the Parisian, the Spanish, the French, and etc., etc. All this is funny, but very naive also. And um, <clears throat> so um, it was a good material. I was, and, and I, politically, I was already aware. And uh, I wanted to write history, and I wrote it through, through cinema. As, but it was difficult. The editing was very difficult. In fact, it was the beginning of the numerical. We could have edited on numerical. But at that time, at the change time between 35 and numerical, numerical was very expensive. And we didn't have the money. So we edited in 35. And it wasn't easy because you... And um, so I emptied my apartment and we edited there. And, uh, and that's how we did this film. I mean, it was difficult. It was with a German... Uh, it's in Strasbourg. There was a German section of RT. And they were the one interested by my experience, and they helped me. And even when I asked more money, which is rare that they give you more after they give you the budget, they understood how difficult it was to edit all this material. And I needed to shoot again with the girls so as to link the story. And uh, so they accepted, and they helped me to do it. It took us a long time in a very long time, to match all this together. And you had uh, a project of a cinematic uh, with this film. How, what happened? Well, we did it. We did it at that time. I uh, had also help from French ministry. And gather, the idea is after the war, I said, we have to suddenly, everything called filmmaker and anything called film was for me, uh, a treasure and I had this conscience and I gathered it and I gathered uh, I found also this is to repertory then I I found 35 millimeter prints and they were in this big room where we shot with Mirna and Michel and uh, the French government uh, restored 35 prints and it was the first stone of a cinematheque with all these cassettes. But then this ministry, then as Mirna said, war, sec, you think you finished war and then there is a bombing and then there's a fight again and, and, and. And so they like used, instead of keeping this and they stored it and they, they didn't use it well and, and uh, they were again destroyed partly. But now there is a, a new generation who says we have to refine this work of Jocelyn and uh, and uh, make a cinematic again and keep it. So I hope they will do it. Anyway, the film in itself is a cinematic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Mirna, so it was your first experience as uh, in a film, right? For yes, it's my first movie. So it really somehow launched your career. Uh, what what happened afterwards? How how did you work with other directors? Was it the same with was working no, with it was uh, never the same <laughs> was the, special. the most special one was Jocelyn because she we became friends and she not only she we worked together but she helped me change as a person as well my way of thinking my way of becoming a woman because <laughs> you see there was a kiss in the movie it took me three hours to do this to do this kiss <laughs> I drove them crazy. At the end, they were starting, they start all kissing each other in the movie, in front of me, the whole team, <laughs> for me to be more brave and, and uh, make this mini kiss. Uh, and after that, I worked with many other directors and it was always interesting, but uh, Jocelyn was the most um, 
unique experience. And she did the School of Cinema after that also. Yes, actually I I started with architecture. I always wanted to work in cinema because my grandpa was one of the first film distributors in Lebanon. And the first movie I saw, I was three, it was Jesus Christ of Nazareth on a big screen. I was traumatized for the rest of my life. But I kept the love for cinema. And Jocelyn was the trigger because um, having lived the war, you have conservative Lebanese parents who say you have to become a doctor. So my father sent me to all the medical schools to present uh, these tests. And of course, I gave white papers everywhere. So I had zero, null. <laughs> and then I decided after my, I had to run to the artistic uh, like art uh, school started with architecture Jocelyn picked me up for the movie and she made a deal with the director of the school she said I will give her a note for her work and they gave me 18 on 20 and and the director accepted that I do the cinema school after and but I had to study a year in two months I remember something like that but I made it and I studied film and this saved me because I moved to Germany I became German and um Having studied film saved me because in Germany I couldn't keep on being an actress. I couldn't speak German and I looked Arab. And 15 years ago, the Germans said, no, das geht nicht. <laughs> so I had to stick to what I learned and I'm very happy for that. And you did a film. I did a film called Berlin Beirut. You can watch it on YouTube. And at that time, Jocelyn read the script and gave me the best tips. <laughs> um, yeah, this was my first... Uh, experience in Germany. I'm very grateful for it because it was support from the German Film Förderung at that time, the Berlinale as well. It was a door, a door. But again, this was just the history of Lebanon and the love to Germany that made it work. So this is quite confusing, no? Are you confused? No. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can take some question from uh, the audience now. Please do. Many, I'm, I'm sure many things you haven't understood. So do, please do ask questions. Until you get the mic, I want to say something to my kids. Uh, bei uns uh, Waffen sind verboten und auch Spielzeugwaffen sind verboten. Ich, ich, Im Film, ich sehe mich dreimal mit Waffen. Das ist ein Film, ja? Das, nicht das Nutzen danach. Ja. So, bitte, bitte schön. Uh, I have a question. Um, if Uh, because yesterday already in the, or not two days ago in the film Beirut Maville, uh, reminded me uh, of um, the film uh, La Serra et les Champs de l'Oubli by Asa Jeba, which is a film that uh, she made in the, in the early 80s and it consists entirely of uh, footage that was shot by colonial units in the Maghreb. And uh, now again, I feel that um, there's some, there's some sim similarities uh, to the technique of you know using an archive and recomposing a, a history in a way but even if 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 you were not aware of the film my the question would be if if you consider this image archive also an archive of co a colonial archive in a way that cinema is also a way to colonize um the culture or country yeah uh, yes i was aware um of Afia, asia jebar's work at that time But, um, I mean, um, this came very spontaneously. I mean, uh, um, I knew history of my country, even if it was, as she said, we didn't learn it at school. I, I uh, learned it more because I lived the war. And when you live the war, you, you ask yourself much questions about why and unconsciously, even if you were living day by day what was happening, I was questioning myself. And, uh, and it's the shock that I received when I came back uh, to Beirut, because I, I left in 85, I, ha I was pregnant, I had a child, and then um, I decided to come back and make a film. And I was so shocked by the mentality of the people in the city. It was um, money, 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 money. It was uh, reconstructing the city, the buildings, but nothing reconstructed in the head of the people. 
no education, nor in the school, nor on TV for the population, uh, nothing to make the people uh, forget, understand why they hated each other by community, civil war, Christian, Muslim, what's the problem with Israel, what's the problem with the other countries, Sunni, Shia, no explanation, nothing. And this shocked me. And people were just uh, like after all wars, you just want to live, live, live. And there was a lot of money thrown on the country to be reconstructed, but nothing in school, nothing in education, um, nothing on TV, no, not a program. And this shocked me really. And I think I was the only one at that time to think about patrimony. And in fact, um, since my first films, I'm a sort of pioneer of this memory, of constituting this uh, memory. It was, I don't know, it's my generation, the generation of Asya Jabba, which is a bit, was a bit older than me, but I knew about al and all these stories, etc. And um, I don't know, it was something, in, a feeling inside me that made, made me consider. Uh, and, and I had discovered also in the war value of the image, because I don't come from uh, cinema school. I come from uh, economical school. I did economy and done a master in Paris because of my parents. But then uh, I was looking to everything in, uh, uh, in a social way, economical way, anthropological way. That's maybe why I was more aware of history than if I just went out from a cinema school and just also uh, was uh, doing uh, aesthetic or aesthetic film or, you know, just just stories. And um, it's the very difficult in war to make love stories very simple. You can make it later on. Look, in Vietnam War, it took them 10 years, it took Coppola 10 years before doing a first film. You need distance. And I jumped in very, very quickly. I never left, in fact. Ich finde es toll, dass Mama Filme spielt. Danke. Danke. Um, uh. Hast du gelernt? Hast du was gelernt? Hast du, hast du verstanden, was das ist? Dass es Beirut ist? Ja, das weiß ich. Das weißt du. Also, Fantastic, thank you. But if I may also ask a question, um, could you tell more about the, um, the settings where you shot, particularly the cinema? Um, well, the, the, the beginning of the film couldn't be anything else than the destroyed city. At that time, we were living with it. It, it hasn't been erased yet. And, um, and I knew it by heart because I was enough crazy during the war so as to walk through, I saw the city getting destroyed in, the, in 76 in Beirut uh, Jamais Plus in my, uh, the film you, some of you saw the other day. So, um, I used to walk in the city when I film, as if I was walking when I'm going into car, public cars or when I was 13 and 14 and 15 and 16. So I took Mirna and Michelle in the beginning of the film in these main streets which were heart of my city and heart of my city is was my heart. And um, for them, it was something like very strange and very new to go in this destroyed center of Beirut. And um, <clears throat> then I, I located the different uh, places, like the Cinematheque, 
was uh, an old usine, um, factory of biscuits and uh, lukum, you know, that you eat when you are a child, because the, the structure was interesting from outside. Then when they go down to see him, it was very funny because it was our, both of us, our, uh, the school of sisters, uh, religious nuns that we went to. It was the place where we uh, had our lunch and uh, dinner when we were at school. So for both of them and for me, uh, I, w I was taking sometimes place familiar, sometimes for me, sometimes for them too. And um, ah, the cinema. Cinema was um. Uh, I sh I had repertoriated um, most of the cinemas, and I knew that in Beirut it was difficult and they were destroyed, and I discovered why I was researching for the film and the cinematheque, I discovered that the city of Tripoli, which is in the north, was a city of lovers of cinema. And uh, I discovered it was also uh, intellectually a very rich cinema. They knew about Egyptian cinema. They were more near, you know, from Tripoli, you have Baghdad, Damas, Baghdad. They were more Arabish in culture. Tripoli was um, uh, really an educated city in a way, which was not not the case after that. Uh, these last years was is the most fundamentalist city, and they destroyed everything. So I went to the city, and I have a very nice little story, because I met one guy who was um, who had four or five cinema. And uh, I was going, I remember, twice a week to have breakfast with him and um, listening to his own story. That's how I invented the character of the guy of the Cinematheque. And um, he, bega he began as a boy that carries the boxes of film in 10 cinemas. And he finished as the biggest programmer of the city. And uh, the dialogue of Mr. Farouk, he really gave it to me because I asked him one day, how did you program film? And then he said, I looked to the photos and the posters, and if the poster uh, talked to me, it meant that the film was good. And that's how, for instance, he discovered Cécile Bédomil and uh, light his uh, images. And we had lots of American films at that time. So... Um, we looked in Tripoli in the different cinemas, and we find one of the oldest one. It was from the beginning of twenty twenties. Now it's a supermarket, like. And uh, he gave us the cinema, and we we could shoot there. And the films where she walks on at what moment, which are real, his real um, real material. We didn't compose. That was the set. And um, the other, uh, when they go into a huge uh, 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 archive room, yeah, this is the one of the biggest distributor in Beirut. I, with this guy, I made a deal. I say, okay, I give you so much money, and, and I'm out, depending on our budget, and you will allow me to take any right, any. F you will allow me to take any right to film, anything I want. So uh, we were shooting, we were finding films in his list. Sometimes they were not in his list. We were finding them while we were shooting. And uh, we invented the scene. Uh, for instance, when they give the names of the film, I let them invent, depending on the place the camera stopped and, and uh, what they did. And uh, saying the names, which were very funny, because all names about love are really original and um, because when you work for TV, now everybody takes any shot from YouTube or anything and makes a film without asking the rights to uh, the author. And um, at that time, if I didn't have 
for each second I was using in a film the right, I couldn't uh, use it. The TV wouldn't um, put the film on the air. So like this, I had all already a big uh, amount of film and it was solved. Because to negotiate the American films or, for instance, there's a film uh, uh, with Belmondo and Jen Seberg in Beirut, which was a pastiche. Pastiche is an imitation of uh, the famous Jean-Luc Godard film. And uh, it was owned by Gaumont. And they asked me 100,000 francs at that time for one shot. So, and I dreamed to have it for a cinephile. It was Belmondo and Seberg. Everybody knows this famous film. And I um, could not use it. And um, so that's how I, uh, th there was the cinema places. And then when we shot the second time, and we had little money, and uh, so I brought Mirna and Michelle, the other actress, to Paris. They stayed at my home. And we found not very far a little house, a garden. Uh, house. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, in my house we shot, but also in a small hotel and garden not very far. We looked like, uh, because we had a little budget to continue. But it was fun. All this, it was fun. Uh, speaking about financing the film, uh, could you maybe tell um, the amount of money that the whole film costs you? Uh, because, um, for example, uh, just uh, this music piece of Ennio Morricone, um, for example, must have been quite expensive, I could guess. Really, so many years ago, <laughs> I have to open the file in my head. I can't really remember, but it... No, it didn't cost millions. Um, really, I can't remember how much they gave me. But uh, I was praying everybody. And I had put an assistant to negotiate, saying it's war, it's our country, it's our memory. We were playing on this argument to negotiate. Yeah, to, or to get f for free many films. And the Arab films, I, I told you, I had negotiated before the shooting. And um, I, I remember I found a Yugoslavian film shot in Beirut, and it was a cinema attack. There was a beginning of troubles in Yugoslavia. And even so, the, the cinema attack was uh, heartfully with us. They sent the film. We didn't use it at the end. But um, many people were composing, and it was 100 years of cinema, so people were listening to our demands. And sometimes we were rejected, really rejected, saying, you know, like with uh, uh, Seberg and Mole Belmondo in Beirut, which is an adorable film imitating uh, Godard's film. And... Um, Well, this is it. Hello. Um, I have lots of questions, but I will try to make it short. Um, so for you, both of you, um, Ms. Macaron, she all, um, already said that she uh, knew already as a child that she wanted to uh, work in a cinematic um, environment. Um, But uh, as you also um, explained that you came here to Germany and they told you that you cannot work as an actress, so you had to choose to work um, as a um, filmmaker. Um, do you still have that dream to, to like to be an actress? Have you, do you have any re regret on that? And the same question for um, Ms. Saab. Um, Did you also already, because I think as far as I know, you started as a um, journalist, your career, or did I miss something? Um, and then you became a filmmaker. 
Um, so would you also say that you've kind of fulfilled your life purpose? So <laughs> have you any regrets on that? Um, and in your opinion, second question, um, okay, sorry. <laughs> I have to do it. You know, I learned with age, I'm 43, life is not linear. You have dreams, you have many dreams. And my dream was to become an actress. I dreamt since I was a child, I knew I wanted to do that. And this is what helped me, knowing what I wanted, helped me stick there but uh, and hang on there. But then I also love telling stories and I'm very happy. At that time, we didn't really have a school of acting in Lebanon. So I found myself learning about how to make movies and tell stories, which I liked. And... And then I kept acting in Paris and in Lebanon and I had an agent in Paris, but then I met a German man and I moved to Germany and I took the decision to be here. So I had to struggle again. So I started from zero three times in my life. And I, and I, and when I came, it was 2000. So it was before the 11th of September, right? Yeah. Shortly before. And, um, I couldn't speak German, which is actually, I'm in a country that is huge. And if you are an actor in this, I mean, if, if you go to Lebanon as a German, you cannot become an actor. It's the same. So I st tried for a year and it didn't work. So it was tough and, and I had to give up this dream, unfortunately. I was sad for two, three years, but then I was happy because I made this little movie, Berlin, Beirut, and realized that I can also keep on in this direction. So I didn't really give up totally my dream. And in the past years, I, I was taking acting workshops with uh, a guy called Jean-Louis Rodrigue, who's amazing. And I realized that I'm happy I'm not doing this. It's a very, very tough job that I love and respect very much. But you have to give a lot of time and dedication. And uh, I, I, I can't be someone else anymore. I used to love this when I was a child playing all kinds of characters, but now it's very tough. And having children, being a mother, I, I have to focus. <laughs> so I became German somehow. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... Uh, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, in fact, I didn't want to be a journalist. I wanted to be uh, at school. I knew I wanted to make cinema, but I did not know how. And then I asked my, fa my family to send me... I finished at the age of 16 school and I asked, I asked them to send me to France or London to study cinema and they refused. They said you are too young. So I did economy, the image of my father who worked in banking and, uh, and the way to arrive to cinema was journalism and uh, quickly I realized it's not radio, it's not written journalism, it's image. And if you see my film, slowly I took the distance with the classical way of working and did very personal films and became a filmmaker. So you choose your, it's, longer, it's a longer way. Uh, I missed technique in the beginning, but uh, finally in war, you don't have time to think. You want to film a film. There's no time to to choose, to, 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 to complicate the thing for yourself, saying, I don't know how to do. And I was alone to go, to decide to record as a woman and local woman. So, well, I went. Maybe I had this courage some people did not have, and I have a, a look. And... Uh, that's how I did my films, my documentary films. Ask some more? Okay. <laughs> um, and um, if, if you compare um, the Lebanese cinema in the past to now, um, in your opinion, what does have to change, or in cinema in general, also American films? Um, In Lebanese cinema before and now? Yeah. Uh, with the Americans? Well, no, or, or, or in also in general, in uh, cinema in general, if it's international films. Um, so first... Lab I think cinema is, is mainly about, like, rep 
reproducing reality. And for me, it's embellishing reality, but it's like many filmmakers go from what's happening today and tell stories. So it evolves with each generation and the times. And also it's very personal cinema. I think f for every filmmaker, it depends for what he wants to say, his story or what's happening around him or what he likes. You have film, I mean, in Lebanon, you don't have many filmmakers telling children's stories or fantasy stories. This is very rare because they want uh, to tell more personal stories. But I don't know. I don't. Um, it evolved. I think it's like because um, also there are many schools now. There were no school. There were many, yes. many, many schools. Many cinema schools. Yeah. Yeah. So there are many people doing it. Not everybody's becoming filmmaker. Some do it and then leave. Some doing it and make public advertisement. But uh, no, the cinema developed. I mean, I was alone as a woman, then came another one. Now you have many girls shooting mostly documentaries. Uh, you have um, one or two f women filmmakers uh, succeeding in commercial, co big commercial films. Uh, we have uh, Nadine Labaki selected to the Cannes Festival this year. And... Um, and we had a film selected in Ven to Venice. Yeah, I mean, there are much more filmmakers in town than before. And many of them also study a part in Beirut and a part in Canada or Sweden or in Finland or Germany and come back. So it's much more globalized, much more different. And, and on the documentary side, there's interesting things because they are writing the history, the, the time they know, the time they lived. And uh, everyone is telling his own story, sometimes stopping after that, doing one. There are many filmmakers of one or two films and then stopping. And, uh, but at least it makes a memory, it makes a story. It, it, it takes time to build an industry, especially uh, there's not big money given by the states to encourage cinema. There is no funds. No very funds little, at very all. little. Like some foundations. Yeah. So this is... A problem because you go and beg the money from France, from Germany, from you beg a little. So this is a big problem too. But there are many Arab filmmakers, more, much more Arab women filmmakers are, um, as in the West. A lot of Arab women, right? Yeah. In the industry, much more than the States, I would say. It's changing, it's coming. Thanks a lot. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question concerning the silent movie quotation. So, um, is it a French production? Was it a French Arabic production? And uh, as we, um, during our discussion, you mentioned that you took the quotation from this. Um, um, yeah, cineast, uh, cinema enthusiast in Lebanon. So maybe uh, um, what he said is right that there is an some kind of uh, influence of the silent movie. Um, in, of, yes, I, I didn't know that there was an influence, or there might be an influence. So did you discover something like this that the silent movies influenced the Lebanese film production of the later years? <rire> I can try in French if you like. <rire> Donc, euh, en fait, c'est la première fois que j'ai vu un film euh, muet, des, un film qui a... Qui, et je me suis demandé si c'était un film arabe ou bien c'était un film français d'abord. Et euh, après, je me suis demandé si vous avez, puisque vous avez fait une, une, une telle recherche, si vous avez découvert découverte une, euh, une influence de, du film muet sur le cinéma libanais après. Parce que je ne me suis jamais rendu compte qu'il pourrait y avoir une, une telle influence. En fait, uh, in fact, um, this film is a French, it's from Eugène Le Sompier. And, um, but you know, at that time, uh, uh, films were, uh, mute films were very much influenced by uh, the, Uh, Lorient, but, and they liked the sheikhs and uh, the princesses and the gold and all this. 
So I retourne, uh, comment dire? I, I, yeah, I reuse this film in a total other meaning. I, I forgot about the story of Eugène de Sentier, and I took the f elements of this film uh, to make my own legend. I invented an Arab legend for the city of Beirut through the image of Eugène de Sentier, who talks about a whole total different story. Um, that was very much fun. And for that time, it was very, um, come on, the, uh, courageous because you, you did it. it was a, a big sin to to use images from another film and change the meaning, etc. Even in the other films, in the American films, I sometimes I, I use a shot from one film in another film, and I was criticized like, how you dare do so? And and now everybody does it in everywhere. Even there's this a theory of essay or some people who study this to how to do this thing. And um, that it influenced all European cinema for sure, influenced uh, the main Arab cinema was in Cairo. And there was for sure an influence, but not only on f with French cinema, but uh, with American cinema, and also with Bollywood, because Cairo is a sort of Bollywood of cinema. It was the second in the beginning of the century of cinema as producer before India. Then India became much bigger. And um, yes, yes, if you see the mute films in Egypt, because the first mute films are in Cairo, um, they are inspired by the subject of the films. And at the same time, uh, they tell the story of what's happening. They're both. But um, for instance, melodrama in an Egyptian film was um, has a big place. And, and they were inspired by Douglas Sirk, for instance, a lot. I mean, each filmmaker was inspired by someone he loved because they uh, tra traveled for a while. But in Cairo, the, what made the specificity is that they had very early, in very early time, an Egyptian school. And uh, they became authentic when they beca uh, began to adapt their own novels, not the, only the European or American novels. And if you study this cinema, it's very interesting. There's a small period before Saudi Arabia puts his hand on production and pushed everybody to produce bullshit films to kill cinema, um, to kill heart of cinema and quality. And uh, there is their biggest uh, uh, writers and some of them writing short stories were really huge scenarists for the time, big scenarists. Uh, that's the story. Uh, you know, I was writing um, a scenario of the two film of, uh, of the Laban first Lebanese filmmaker, which is a woman. And she left Beirut by boat, hidden in a boat, because she had a cousin who was a bit revolutionary and followed the king who wanted to make the Arab uh, land, the Arab Hawaii kingdom. And she was married very young. She left everything, even her daughter, went to Cairo on a boat. She had a cousin there. And she joined the first woman filmmaker, well, the first filmmaker is a woman in Egypt, because she was a woman of theater and did a film. And she became, and nobody speaks enough about her, they give another version in the books. She became uh, first produ biggest producer and one of the first actress actresses of the mute film. She was not so, such a good an act actress, but a really very good producer. She did over 50 films and in different periods, different styles. And I had to stop because 
um, working on it for personal reasons. But uh, I think we owe her, we owe her an, an homage. We should talk about her and rewrite history as it really it is. Recently, in a book on cinema, a huge book like this, went out from Beirut. And again, it was the same story. And talking about a, this woman, like, just uh, passed like a little thing while she was the one that really went to the center of cinema in Cairo, produced films, produced the biggest filmmakers of Cairo. Um, What's her name, Jocelyn? Um, so, Asya Dakhir. So I was writing her real life story, and um, I don't know why I stopped. Yeah, because it was related to also to Fatan Hamama's stories, the biggest Egyptian uh, actor, like the Catherine the Nerve, let's say, of France, or I don't know who we, who we could cite in Germany. She died, uh, and it was a shock for me because I needed. Uh, uh, that the story was told by this famous actress, so as to give reality to the importance of this woman. And uh, then I had some health problems and I, I stopped it. But I wrote it, I will publish it. Yeah, we, we have just two or three more minutes left before we have to leave because next screening is coming up. But I would like to um, ask you, Jocelyn, if you could, unless, of course, you wouldn't like to, but if you could uh, tell about the, um, the projects you're currently working on. Well, you are making me pass from here to here. It's so difficult. Uh, yes, it's um, in some words. It's the portrait uh, of a girl who was hidden by her mother for 27 years, uh, living on false passport, false paper. And the mother was head of Red Army. She was Japanese. It was the period in 68, 70s, where there were revolutions everywhere, dreaming of revolutions everywhere, here in Germany. and. Uh, in Japan, and she married, mother married the Palestinian who was a leader, and uh, it was the period where the Palestinian and the Israeli kill each other by secret services. Uh, they didn't recognize it at that time, but now they did recognize. And so this girl was raised like a, like a sort of secret service little girl since the age of three, and um, it was the story, sorry, the story of this binom that she kept uh, not existing until the mother was in action. And this was until year 2000, sorry, when she was 27 years old. The mother was arrested, put in prison, and then she became free. And she got a real passport, Japanese recognized her, etc., etc. And she went to Japan and became an anchor and a very famous journalist. But she couldn't stand the idea that uh, she's free and the mother is in prison. So after 10 years, she realized she's still in a, another prison, the prison of the media, et cetera, et cetera. And she came back to Beirut and um, gave all her life to defend her mother because her mother was defending a cause. Uh, although the mother was called the Red uh, Sorcière, which, and um, so she had, so it's a film also about nostalgia, nostalgia of a period in the 70s where we dream to change this world and with political movement, etc. and it was a big failure. We didn't change the world. And it's a, it's a, Nostalgic uh, also because when the mother raised her, her daughter hidden, she had left Japan, but she raised her daughter as a Japanese girl, not as an Arab little girl. Uh, and uh, so she, since she left Japan, she had this nos nostalgia. The mother was very educated, high level, became a teacher, has a doctorat, uh, so very brilliant woman. And um, the daughter 
when she became free and could speak on media about her life and become a person like you and me, find suddenly that she was uh, manipulated by media, by press, and her most precious period was her childhood, where she was hidden and where she was the hero of a group of commandos, which was Red Army and not uh, easy people, let's say. And, and But this period, she was someone, she was a hero, hero with her mother and the other. And um, so this is the story, I will depict the period. And what is incredible is that the life of this woman has been linked to two filmmakers, famous one, um, a Japanese one. Um, one who used to do a pink and art pink films just because in Japan it was censorship. So he made over 100 of them. Koji Wakamatsu. Koji Wakamatsu. And uh, now everybody, students and us, we look at this film. I've never seen someone filming bodies in such a beautiful way. And he stopped doing it when it wasn't any more forbidden. Uh, he died, in fact, four years ago. And um, Adachi, Adachi, who is a very strange story, he came to Beirut and integrated in the political movement. And uh, he said, I want to go and fight. And the Palestinian told him, we have enough fighters, we need filmmakers. It's also a fight. So he teach them how to film, etc. But he was much more implicated. He did three years of prison in Beirut, three years in Japan. And now he is free in Japan, but he's over seven. He's nearly 80. So these two were implicated in this life. So image had in this life, in the life of this little girl, have um, such an importance, hidden image, visible image. And um, it's very, it's very special when you have a filmmaker, two filmmakers, how do you say, like a, um, the protector? Pr like your protector, pr protecting you with images. So this is what I'm working on. If I have time to finish it, I don't know. But it's a documentary. I'm using mostly uh, documents. Okay, Jocelyn, so... Thank you very much for this outview and well since since it's um, the last screening which Jocelyn will attend before she leaves this afternoon back to Paris um, yeah thank you so very much thank for being thank here you and for, for coming thank you Thank you very much Mirna Macaron Vielen yeah. Dank alles And thanks again for Tuwafa Germani for hosting. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here and just a short outview that uh, today at half past five we will have a lecture, by, a short lecture by Mathilde Ruxel about female filmmaking in the near Middle East. Uh, before the screening of Dunya Kiss Me Not On The Eyes, so um, please stay on if you, if you can. And thanks again, Jocelyn. Thank you. Merci. Thank you.